today on Christian World News, Russia passes a law banning American families from adopting Russian children. What it means for that country's 700,000 orphans. And a shocking story of Christian persecution in Nepal, the most Hindu nation in the world. Plus, descendants of an ancient tribe of Israel return to their home. How Christians are helping fulfill biblical prophecy. A new Russian law bans Americans from adopting Russian children. Hello, everyone. I'm George Thomas. My colleague, Wendy Griffith, is on holiday. Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a controversial law forbidding thousands of Russian orphans from going to Americans. And that is creating heartbreak for some would-be parents who are now waiting for their child. John Wagi explains. Basketball stuff. Toys. Michelle Mosley has quite a collection of clothes and toys. Christmas presents she and her husband Paul were gathering for a little one who would soon join them. We've always wanted to adopt. Mm. It's always been our heart, and we decided this is the time. The Christian Nebraska couple has a blog site telling of their wait for six-year-old Artem, who has spent his whole life in a Russian orphanage. His mother gave him up when she learned he had Down syndrome, but it was love at first sight for the Mosleys. The moment he walked in, we knew he belonged to the family. Um, you know, you go along your life, you know something's missing, something's mi or someone's missing your family. And when we met him, we knew that peace was fulfilled. Yeah. When you hear about his story and you start connecting and reading more about him, it's hard for me to uh, not think about him, not really want to take care of him. So. We knew, I knew he was the one too, because you just, you get connected to these kids. Even though you can't see them on a daily basis, you read their story and how you wish that you could help them out. The Mosleys have endured extensive FBI background checks and spent up to $50,000 to make Artem part of their family. They had just one more court date. Then the Russian parliament passed a law in December banning U.S.-Russian adoptions, and President Vladimir Putin signed it, leaving the Mosleys in limbo. When the law passed, it was hard to tell my daughters that we might not get him because we've been preparing a whole year to have him. And so then to have to tell them that we might not get him because of politics, that's, that's the tough thing to break to anybody, you know, that we have no control over this and it's just retaliation and the innocent suffer. The Mosleys say they will work for years if need be to get Artem, even though they're greatly saddened by the Russian law. You can't stop loving him. You know, once you meet him and get to know him, you can't just make my heart and my mind just stop forgetting about him. So we'll wait. You can't make me forget about him. If it's five, if it's 10 years, we'll get him then. <laughs> the Mosleys hope that since they registered for Artem before January 1st, the Russians will still approve their adoption. In the meantime, they wait for a court date to determine the next step. John Wagi, CBN News. What a heartbreak. Well, in recent years, American evangelicals have sharply increased their adoption of children from Ru Russia. Now, for that time being, that's all over. Recently, I spoke with Sergei Rakub of Russian Ministries about the reasons behind the new law and its impact on Russian orphans. Can you tell us why Russia passed this law specifically uh, 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 preventing Americans from adopting Russian children. I think this is just a simple retaliation mm -hmm. against American legislature that just a few weeks before uh, American Congress banned um, Russian corrupt officials mm -hmm. from coming to the United States. And many other countries are thinking about following that uh, pattern. Uh, so that was a Kremlin retaliation, but not against American uh, politicians somehow they decided to retaliate against of their own children. That's the very sad uh, situation. There are about 750,000 uh, orphans and homeless children in, in Russia. What is the government then doing to, to help care, care for these kids? What the Russian government is doing According to their own uh, understanding, they think that they do a lot. They provide those buildings, they provide food, they provide free education. But the most, you know, that's what these children need. They need family care. They need a family 
that will provide love for them, that will love them, that will help them to go uh, over all those difficult issues when teenagers grow. Mm -hmm. And every child deserve, uh, deserves to be loved. And that's what this law proves, you know, so that unfortunately, this is, I call it, not just anti-American law, this is inhumane law. And Sergey, I have seen firsthand what your ministry, Russian ministries, is doing uh, across the former Soviet Union, and specifically dealing with, with orphans and, and going into orphanages and, and giving them a message of hope, encouraging, encouraging them. How, how does this new law, does it affect uh, the way you guys operate uh, at all? Yeah, this is not going to affect uh, our ministry in Russia, I don't think at all. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we are doing now, pushing harder the issue of mobilizing national Christian families to adopt their own children. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, the number of orphans in those institutions is not decreasing, it's growing. And it shows, you know, clearly that there are some moral issues within the family, society, etc. And that's what we're trying to do through our program. It's called uh, a Home for Every Orphan, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to train, to mobilize uh, national Christian families to adopt uh, orphans uh, within the country. And uh, I don't think that this law will affect this work uh, at all to understand that there are so many children in uh, those institutions that they need uh, somebody's love. And so that Christian families will uh, make a decision uh, overcoming that stigma that is there in the Russian society against orphans and will reach out to the orphan community and, and adopt all those who need family who need to uh, have a chance in life and uh, being raised in a situation of hope and uh, prosperity. There is great concern for the special needs orphans, such as those with Down's syndrome. What kind of care do, do they receive? This is even a more sad situation, George. Uh, children with special needs, especially like Down syndrome, they even more stigmatized in Russian orphanages. And they are kept in in uh, uh, those special uh, places for special needs kids. And this law, this inhumane anti-American law, will even ban so many families in the United States that out of their compassionate heart, they go to Russia. And in most of the many cases, they adopt special needs kids, especially kids with the Down syndrome. Uh, and Sergey, uh, Russians celebrate uh, Christmas on January 7th, and I know that you guys have uh, a special project called Project Hope, where you deliver uh, the good news and other material to thousands of children across the former Soviet Union. Tell us about that real quickly, and the importance, what happens when a child receives this, uh, this box. Uh, George Project Hope, this is one of the most exciting uh, projects that uh, uh, we mobilize so many churches, so many Russian leaders, uh, School of the Walls coordinators throughout entire Russia to get involved and deliver this wonderful gifts packed by uh, national churches, sorted by volunteers, supported by American evangelical families. And these gifts of hope are delivered into the hands and placed into the hands of those orphans that are looking for hope. And I know that your ministry is actively involved in bringing that message of hope to thousands of children across the former Soviet Union. Sergei Rokuba of Russian Ministries, as always, sir, great to have you on the show this week. Thank you so much, George. And we want to hear your reaction to this new law and its impact on Russia's orphans. You can leave your comments on our Facebook at CWN uh, Facebook and tell others uh, about it. Up next, shocking stories of Christian persecution from the most Hindu nation in the world. CWNews.org, your constant news source on the World Wide Web. Find daily updates on the global church. Watch the weekly broadcast. Three former presidents come together to honor the life and ministry. Also available in podcast. The in-depth insights into our reporter blogs. Taliban kidnapped at least 18 in South Peru, Korean Christians. Your online news source for complete coverage of the global church. Today, many people are asking, what is the future for America? I believe God created this country to be an exceptional nation with a divine purpose. God has a plan, not only for the redemption of mankind, not only for the people of Israel, 
but for the United States of America. Get Pat Robertson's newest DVD teaching, God's Plan for America, How to Prepare for the Days Ahead. In it, you'll discover how America is built on a Christian foundation, how America became the greatest country on earth, and what we can do to see the favor of God bless our land. There is still an opportunity to enter into a period of unprecedented prosperity and national blessing if we will grasp hold of the plan God has for each one of us. Pat Robertson's God's Plan for America. It's our gift to you when you join the 700 Club. Available now. It began in a prayer meeting where a covenant was made and grew into the most powerful and prosperous nation the world has ever known. But has America broken its covenant with God? Can that covenant be renewed? Does God still have a plan for America? And welcome back to Christian World News. Islamic militants in northern Nigeria killed 12 Christians in two church attacks on Christmas Eve. Six died, including the pastor, when gunmen broke into a prayer service at the Church of Christ in Yobe province. A deacon and five others died in an attack on, a, on the First Baptist Church in Borno State. Nigeria's president says, quote, the church is one of the main targets of terrorist attacks by the radical Islamist group Boko Haram. Speaking at a church in Nigeria's capital, he said, if the idea of Boko Haram is to stop Nigerians from worshipping God, they will not succeed. The group is blamed for killing nearly 800 people in 2012 alone. Sudanese warplanes bombed Christian villages in the Nuban Mountains over the Christmas season also. 11 Christians died in the attacks that took place between December 18th and the 26th. The Arabic Islamic regime in Khartoum has long targeted residents of the Nuba Mountains who are mostly Christian and black Africans. Thousands of non-Arab Sudanese are hiding in caves in the Nuba Mountains. One church leader said they are praying and waiting for the international community to intervene. Iran has arrested Pastor Yusuf Nardakani again, this time on Christmas Day. The pastor was acquitted of a charge of ap apostasy in September, but he was told he would have to finish his three-year sentence for a different crime, evangelizing Muslims. He served all but 45 days of that sentence. Now Iranian authorities claim he needs to go back to prison and finish his time. Nepal is known for being on top of the world. It's also a country where Hinduism and communism struggle for dominance. Christians face widespread persecution in the Asian nation, but as Gary Lane reports, God is on the move. <laughs> I am Sarada. I'm from a Hindu family. Before I came to Christ, my life was in darkness and I didn't know God. Sarada, however, faced persecution from her own family when she left Hinduism for Christianity. When I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior, the persecution started to come into my life. My mother asked me, do you love your religion more than your parents? I told her, I love both. She hated me for following Christ, and she used to say bad words to me. Physical attacks soon followed. Sarada says her mother threatened to kill her with a sickle and blind her with a nail. My mother told me, if you're blind, you will stop going to church. She took the nail, pushed me to the ground, and tried to stick the nail into my eyes. I moved, and the nail hit my ear. Sarada escaped to the jungle where she now lives with a friend. Christians not only come under attack from co-workers and family members, but also churches come under fire from Maoists and Hindu militants. One case in point, this church in a remote region of southwestern Nepal. Namaste. Good to see you, Pastor. Hi, brother. Yes. God bless you. Good yes. to see you. Yes. Good to be with you. Let's sit down and yes. let's have you tell me what's, what's been going on here with your church. Non-believers came to our church and demanded that we join their festivals and worship idols. We told them that we don't worship like this. The Christians refused to help fund the Hindu festivals. When we didn't pay the money, they came and attacked us and took our livestock. 
I was right in this place. 230 villagers with sticks came here and took the two oxen that I kept right in here. Suffering is no surprise to us. Matthew 5.12 says, In my name you will be persecuted and you will be hated. Nepali Christians are also disrespected in death. Hindus usually cremate, but what happens to Christians when they die? This was the only cemetery in all of Kathmandu where Christians could bury their dead, but no longer. Rarely are Christians given a place for burial. Religious extremists believe non-Hindu bodies desecrate the land. Christians report militants often force them to dig up the buried remains of loved ones. One Christian woman reportedly kept her deceased husband's decaying body in her home because she was prevented from burying him. This woman helped hide church members in her house. A rampaging mob attacked them for burying a deceased Christian on village property. So what does the future hold for Nepali Christians? Pastor Karma says his church will stand firm. We want to keep the witness of God in this place and improve the church. Our main purpose is to influence all of the villagers. And God is working in the heart of Mr. Chowdhury, the man who lost his oxen. We are sons and daughters of God. Whatever the villagers took from us belonged to him. We should be satisfied with his word. And what about Sarada? She and her aunt led Sarada's cousin Huma to Christ. I told her, if you find God, then you will know how wonderful he is and you will know God's plan for your life. And now Huma says she wants to share the good news. After I finish my education, I want to share Jesus with those who do not know him. I will walk with him and share the gospel. Even though people offer many animals for sacrifice, they will not be forgiven. Only Christ's blood can bring forgiveness for our sins. I now know that is not the end. God has brought me from darkness to light. Eternal hope and vision at the top of the world. Gary Lane, CBN News, Kathmandu, Nepal. Up next, the future of faith in America. Good news from a new Gallup poll when we come back. CBNnews.com. News you want, when you want, 24-7. Stay current with up-to-the-minute stories. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. I don't have to wait for my news anymore. CBNnews.com at your fingertips all day long. I only watch the stories I want to see. I find the story, I click on it, and boom, I'm there. Embassy in Washington, Eric Stackelbeck, CBN News. The source for your news, CBNnews.com. Come on, Give me that. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need and dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over a hundred countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there providing food thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. <laughs> my life is hectic, so I join CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBN partner and join Pledge Express, because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Good morning. Are you ready to get started? When you care, souls are set free. When you give, lives are made new. When you share, eternal life begins. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Back in 1996, Time magazine asked the question, is God dead? Now, nearly 50 years later, a new book presents proof that God is very much alive to millions of Americans. And as Paul Strand reports, the author believes those numbers will grow even more in the years ahead. The new book's title says it all. God is alive and well. 
And Frank Newport, head of respected pollster Gallup, has the numbers to prove it. We have well over 90% of Americans who in our survey questions say they believe in God. So right there is evidence that uh, at least in the minds of the majority of Americans, God is uh, quite alive. The book's findings about the future of religion in America rest on more than 300,000 interviews conducted last year and in earlier years. Some have declared this a post-Christian age, but Newport says not according to the data. 75 up to 80 percent of Americans are Christian. Americans are religious and may actually be becoming more religious in the years ahead. I think the evidence shows just the opposite. The new leader of the Secular Coalition for America points to research showing a big difference between churchgoers and believers. Of people who participate in religion and go every week, among the Protestants you have about 30 percent that actually go and don't believe in God. Roger cites her own experience as a non-believer going to church events. I went a few times as a early teen with girlfriends. I liked the social side of it um, and got Coke and Lay's potato chip, things like that. She says the number of non-theists and religiously unaffiliated has soared to almost 20 percent, and it's double that among the young. There are quite a number of, uh, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds that w will just come out and say that they're atheists. Newport acknowledges this growth. We call that the rise of the nuns. Now, not in U.S., like the flying nun or something, but in O N E S. In other words, people who say, when we say, what's your religious identity, say they don't have any. And Newport agrees faith can take a beating in many people's youth. Age 23 is the least religious age from 18 to death. But he says faith and church attendance pick up as Americans marry, have children, and age. And that path can lead to better health and other benefits. Being more religious actually causes one to have higher well-being. Newport believes as word of this gets around, it may make religion even more popular. Other reasons he sees a bright future for faith, those over 60 are simply more religious, and baby boomers are beginning a senior explosion. There's also a migration to states that are warmer and better off economically. Many are in the Bible Belt, and newcomers tend to pick up the regional culture. But Rogers looks at other Western nations and thinks America may follow them and lose its faith. We have countries in Europe, like Estonia, where you only have 16 percent of the people in that country that believe in God. Newport just doesn't buy it. I wouldn't say, based on a look at all of our indicators, that we're moving into a post-religious or post-Christian era. Now, when it comes to American politics, Newport and Rogers agree on a general truth. More religious equals Republican, non-religious equals Democrat. Rogers says of these nuns, They are the largest, considered the largest religion within the Democratic Party. She points to one telling event last year. The delegates down at the Democratic Convention, they wanted uh, no mention of, of God even in their platform at all. But Newport thinks Democrats may fight harder for religious voters in the future and points to words from President Obama at a recent prayer breakfast. He started talking about how in his view, religion translates into basically democratic positions on issues like equality and compassion for the poor and things like that. And that suggested to me the possibility that Democrats may begin to contest for the religious voter in the years ahead. Rogers counters that it's still about winning and she's seen the GOP courting the non-theist as younger people swell the unbelievers ranks. They're looking at the demographics, they're looking at the trend, they're seeing the growing numbers, especially under 30 and they would like to stay in business and, and win elections. It all points to cross currents in politics and life here in America, where more than 90% of the people believe in God, but one of the fastest growing groups is those who have no religion at all. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Hi, this is Pat Robertson. This is an important time in the history of America. It's an important time in the history of CBN. And what you do is so very important now. But we've got to get the gospel out here in America. We've got to help the poor and the needy, feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are naked, bring medical attention to those who are suffering, and more than anything, bring hope to those who are without hope throughout the world. So your 700 Club membership makes a huge difference. And I ask you to go to your phone and call. If you haven't already called in, we appreciate what you've done so much. So don't slack. We don't want our hands to be empty. We want to say, Lord, here are those who have come to you because of my labors. Telephones are available, toll-free line, and we just thank God for each one of you. So don't hesitate to call and do it now.
When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Christian World News, your window to the global church for stories of revival. revival. Persecution of relatives and fellow Christians born in the first country over the international day. I'm Coach Thomas in Baghdad and coming up on the broadcast an exclusive interview. And the impact of Christian leaders. Watch Christian World News. And finally this week, a lost tribe has come home to Israel, and the return could be part of biblical prophecy. Chris Mitchell was at Ben Gurion Airport when more than 50 members of the Banai Menasha tribe made history. Their arrival was tearful and emotional. I feel like I'm home. I feel so excited, I feel so overwhelmed, I'm extremely unexplainable, you know, like deep in my heart, I feel like crying. And this group is just the first of a long-awaited migration. Nearly 2,000 tribe members live in Israel, but five years ago the government stopped their return. Now a recent decision permits all the Bene Menashe, about 7,000, to return. The 10 tribes may have been lost to us for many centuries, but they were never lost in terms of their identity. Michael Freund of Chevet Israel worked for years to help bring about this moment. He believes the Bene Menashe return fulfills biblical prophecy. The prophet Isaiah says, Al tira ki ani, fear not, for I am with you, God says. Mimizrach avi zarecha. From the east I will bring your descendants. Your descendants. These are the descendants of Israel, and they are coming back from the east. It is as if the headline of today was written by Isaiah the prophet 25 or 2600 years ago. The Assyrian Empire exiled the tribe of Manasseh almost 3000 years ago. Although they settled in northeast India, tribe members kept their Jewish roots for more than 2000 years. Several Christian organizations help bring them home. And in fact, the Hebrew prophet said when God gathered his Jewish people back from all the ends of the earth in the last days, that there would be Gentiles helping and bringing them back. God said, I'll beckon to the Gentiles. And so we have this invitation from God himself to be involved in this Aliyah. Another nearly 300 are scheduled to arrive in January, with thousands more yet to come. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Ben Gurion Airport, Tel Aviv. Well, thanks for joining us this week. Until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, goodbye and God bless you.